Thank you so much for having us. Today we are actually in Marcella House. First, before we start, can you introduce people about who you are, where are you from, and um, more about the dish later. My name is Maricela or Maricela Vega, and I'm from Havana, Cuba. I was born there, and I came into exile with my family in 1960. So it's been quite a time, um, quite a few years. But still, I consider myself um, an exile. My husband and I have been living in St. Augustine since 05. It's been a very nice place for us to live. We've really enjoyed it. I have lived many other places. Um, in the United States, I've lived up north many times. Um, initially, we came to Miami. And um, after the Bay of Pigs invasion failed, and my father decided, and my mother was pregnant with um, a fourth child, uh, they decided to resettle to St. Paul, Minnesota, where um, I learned to speak English and lived there till the fifth grade. And my sister was born there. Anyway, I wrote a memoir about that experience, including the Cuban resettlement program that um, came into effect to help Cubans resettle out of Miami, because at the time, there were 1,800 Cubans coming in per week. That is how many, and Miami was just flooded. It was not the Miami that it is today with, you know, a million or two million people. And so that's part of my story, part of my story. My first two memories are from my house in Cuba. And, um, you know, over the years I've thought about them a lot, you know, mm -hmm. as to what kind of childhood I was having and what kind of childhood I would have continued to have. However, uh, things changed and so you have to adapt and so we came here. But yeah, my first two memories are from, are from uh, that house on the hill in Kohima, which is about 15 minutes east of Havana. Uh, it's a house on a hill overlooking a bay Mm. And I had the good fortune of, after 50 years in exile, returning to that house mm. and seeing it. They were kind enough to let me in. And um, it was a very important experience for me to be able to return home. Wow. Yes. For various reasons. Many yes. of them were political, on Cuba's side, mm. U.S. side, mm. along with family. Wow. And also, as a writer, I must say, I never really had... Uh, extra funds to be going and traveling. I mean, I, whenever I did have money saved, it was usually to take time off to, to work on my writing. And so it took me quite, quite a while to get back, but it was very well worth it. Wow. I went in 2010. That's 2010. amazing. Yes. That's amazing. It what was incredible. Experience. It was incredible. Well, I'll tell you what, we still have family there. And so um, they invited us to eat quite a bit. <laughs> My sister and I, I invited my sister, I asked her to please join me on that trip. And um, so we ate at their house, okay, a lot. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a lot of beans and rice. It was whatever they could get that day, mm -hmm. okay? So sometimes it was uh, more, sometimes it was less, but it was always cooked with love and presented nicely and... It was, it was great to, to be with them mm -hmm. and share meals with them. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I like beans and rice, okay? Black beans and rice, that's Cuban, period. That's what we <laughs> <laughs> And so we may have that twice a day. Twice a day, that's wow. fine. And we, I did bring some things. I knew there were shortages. Uh, the food shortage, especially in Havana, is um, it's quite difficult. And there's a discrepancy between what the tourism, uh, the tourists uh, get served and eat and what's available to the Cuban people. Mm. For example, I remember one time I was in Havana and I got there and I was looking for a yogurt because I knew milk was impossible. Because after, I think, age 11, this was before. I don't know if it's changed. You couldn't, it, you, only children could have milk up to age, I think, 11. So I knew I couldn't have milk, but yogurt, you know, I was like, for cereal. Like, and then after 40 minutes, I gave up because I knew. But that was 2010, 2011. I don't know. I have not been up mm -hmm. 
following uh, what's going on in Cuba since that time. So I know that um, the Puerto Ricans, they do eat, eat black beans, mm -hmm. and um, I think in the Dominican Republic as well, but some are more, the, the Puerto Ricans more into red beans. Mm -hmm. And the Dominicans, frankly, I don't remember, because when I was there, I lived there for three months one time um, as an artist in residence, and I did my own cooking, so although I ate on the street as well, I don't know, I don't remember what they, their claim is, but I don't know, uh, other countries, they have their own, I know the Salvadorans have a different type of red bean that mm. they use, and even parts of Cuba, the eastern provinces, they're more into the red bean. Mm -hmm which, because of their proximity to Haiti, that came from Haiti, mm -hmm. or that's what I understand. Okay. okay, so that province on the eastern side is more from Haiti, and of course Haiti and the Dominican Republic share an island, so frankly, I don't know. The recipe and ingredients you have today, and maybe through that you can tell us more about it. Okay, okay, I'm happy. Today I wanted to make arroco camarone, which is rice with shrimp, and um, the reason I chose this dish is because um, it's, a, it's a classic, it's a basic, and the protein can be interchanged. So if you are vegan and you like garbanzos, and garbanzos are very Spanish, but tofu, I haven't tried it with tofu, chicken, I sometimes like to put chorizo in, or whatever, but I thought shrimp, um, because of our proximity to Mayport, although I did not get the Mayport shrimp, which I did get an Argentine red shrimp, but um, I wanted to present it. It's not difficult to make, and um, with all these dishes, basically you just, anytime you cook, you have to, first of all, want to do it. Uh, you have to, you have to concentrate, and, you know, you have to be happy about what you're cooking, because many times I've been there cooking, I'm like, hey, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not up to it, I don't feel like it, but, this is a dish that I think, and it's also a building block to the Spanish paella, but maybe one day I'll get there, but it's a building block, so you can see how, well, how the paella is related to this dish. So, um, one of the, what I'd like to start telling you about is the basic uh, foundation of Cuban cooking is the sofrito, S-O-F-R-I-T-O. The sofrito is that's most of our dishes begin with sofrito, even black beans or chickpeas or red beans. Anyway, rice and uh, so many dishes begin with the sofrito. So I thought this would be a good way to teach you that, the sofrito. And um, let me plug it in. I haven't done that. So just put some olive oil in there. Uh, the recipe has it. Let me heat this up a little bit. Okay, so it's got to get, here's my recipe, and um, so it's garlic, green pepper, onion, Spanish onion, or yellow onion, and I use tomato, fresh tomato. Some people use tomato sauce, some people use the, the um, tomatoes that are in a can, which I do not care for because I don't like that metallic taste. Anyway, so a couple of garlic cloves, and what I'm using here is a rock now to mm -hmm. mash the garlic. Mm -hmm. And this is my great aunt Carmen. When we lived in Minnesota, she got this rock from the Great Lakes, mm -hmm. okay? Wow. And she said, This is a good rock for cooking. <laughs> and so all my siblings and I, we all have a rock in our kitchen because. We like it, it's useful. My younger brother likes to grill uh, using this to hold up the meat or whatever. And um, we call it the Tilly Stone. So anyway, this is, you see, it's quite fast to cut, to get the garlic, you know. Just smash it up with the rock. And then we have the garlic, right? I'm just gonna chop it quickly. How's this going? It's good, okay. But see, you don't need anything really fancy. You just need a rock, really. <laughs> <laughs> just don't. It's just easy to clean. You don't have to, okay, right. you know. And uh, I know you can buy garlic minced already, but frankly, not for me. Not for me. I don't like. I don't care for it. But anyway, so I'll just so quickly. 
Yes. Nothing like garlic. Um, my great aunt was the one who taught me to make the sofrito. Mm. And um, she was really a fantastic cook and she did, she cooked a lot um, for us and family meals and stuff like that. And my grandmother too, my grandmother's pictures over here anyway, they were both sisters, they were both Spaniards. And they came to Cuba I believe in 1923 mm -hmm. and they came with their father anyway to work. So anyway, they married Cuban men and then they came into exile as well in 1960. And my aunt taught me, cook the hardest ingredients first, the densest ingredients first. So the garlic usually went in first, and so that's where I start. So it's good. It's always good to have garlic. You can't get enough garlic, as far as I'm concerned. Okay? So green pepper, all right? Green bell pepper. Okay, is what is used, you know, um, try not to change out the ingredients, you know, the green bell pepper is what we use, we don't use any other. Oh, it feels good. Yeah, <laughs> it, it should be. <laughs> okay, so we cook it a little bit there, and then it's time for the onion, which we use the yellow onion or the Spanish onion, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm very strict about this. See it? Mm -hmm. Use this onion. Do not. <laughs> there are so many onions. They're all wonderful. Look, they're all wonderful. I love onions. But this is the one that comes with the traditional dish. Okay. This is the one, along with the bell pepper. It does make different, oh. right? The different type of onion. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, okay. So let's see what's going on here. This has to cook a little bit. So anyway, this basic sofrito, as you can see. Um, just wait till the onion begins to soften, and um, then we'll, we'll move along and, and do the rest of it. Um, what comes next? I would like to talk a little bit about the rice before I throw it in with the shrimp. This rice, and it's important, I've washed it two times. I don't know if you guys, do you guys wash your rice? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The rice, a lot of people don't wash their rice, and I said, look, you have to wash the rice when I've been teaching. It, it does make a difference. It lowers the glycemic value as well. I've had some diabetics in class that came back and said, you know what, the glycemic value had really lowered once you get the starch down. So it's important to wash the rice two times. You know, put water in it, rinse, water, rinse, and and that's it. The rice I am using is Valencia short grain rice. Mm. For this particular dish, I think the paella takes it too, so does the arroz con pollo. Okay, but when you're doing bean dishes and things like that, you use the longer grain rice. So we use mostly the short grain Valencia or the long grain white rice. Mm. And um, that's what we use. And then Goya, I just found this today because I was running around looking for rice actually. They call it California pearl rice. I have no idea what's going on with California, if they just started growing this or what. I've never seen this before. But it says arroz tipo valenciano on the bottom, so it's that same Valencia rice. But California pearl rice, that's what it's called now. At least <laughs> in that. Okay, so that's what I want to tell you about that. The sofrito is very simple. Actually, uh, talking about the rice, growing up in Iraq, I al we always uh, use uh, jasmine or oh. rice tea. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I grow up, I never thought that there are other types of rice and it will be cooked in different ways. When I moved into the U.S., we had maybe, and my husband here actually today too, but how long we spend, maybe one month or two, trying to figure out why I don't know how to cook the rice here. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> and when I reached to my mom, she's like, well, there's different type of rice. And, sure. and I didn't know that. Like, because every type of rice, there's a specific time of like, uh, yeah. how much you leave it in the water before you cook it. 
and uh, how much you put water to the rice so you could cook it right. Right. So I didn't know that until I came here and I found that there are many different types of rice. Yes. Yes, there are. There are. So I appreciate that you uh, talked about that specific type. Well, you know, rice is a very, um, it doesn't seem, but it's a very, uh, there's a lot of variety in rices. And I also learned recently that um, the rice growing low country in the North Carolina, South Carolina, when the plantations there were bringing in slaves, they were bringing them from West Africa because they knew that those West Africans were skilled rice farmers. Mm -hmm. And that is why they specifically asked for the Gullah Geechee. Those are the Gullah Geechee people. Mm -hmm. They were skilled in rice growing. It's not uh, as simple, I don't know, maybe we don't even think much about it, except that it's good and that it's a nice staple to have, but um, it's definitely, uh, cultivation is, is uh, more skillful than one would think. I was just reading, sci anyway, Science Magazine had an article on rice, and it was talking about China, how the north of China and the south of China, the south is growing rice, the north is growing wheat, and um, the complexity of the cultivation and the cooperation it takes and the communal activity versus the wheat growing uh, communities of the north that wheat allows for more individualistic behavior. Mm -hmm. So within one country, you think, well, it's just rice, but no, the south and the north, wheat and rice, very different uh, traditions emerge. Wow as a result of the nature of what you're growing. Wow. Which, you know, makes sense. I can barely grow something, so I just, I don't know, I can grow herbs. But it is something, it's a skill. So you do grow, grow herbs? Oh, I have a few up there. Maybe you should have to me. Okay, so I've added the tomatoes here. Okay, and then, um, let me see. I have the shrimp, tomato sauce, and a baby. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Okay, that would be great. And then let me get the baby. I'd like to talk a little bit about coloring. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a bay leaf. Cubans use bay leaf a lot, and especially in their beans. I think that's what. Yes, this one. You yep. use it? Yeah, mm -hmm. they own it. Why is it hot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it came from you guys. Probably. Okay. And the burning shrimp without the uh, skin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Took off. I took off. I cleaned it. Okay, there was the shrimp. Now the coloring, you will see that I have, I don't know if this is in Arabic or Persian. I don't know. Oh wow. My oh, is that fine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is so the flavor. Yes, yes. So saffron is used in the Spanish dishes, of mm -hmm. course, you know, for yellow. And you guys are the expert in this. I've never used it. I did not grow up using it because we. It's expensive. It's yeah, so expensive. and That's we right. did not have money for saffron. So therefore, I just show it. I still haven't learned to use it, but. It's an important spice. I think originally from Persia. Mm -hmm. There's some um, argument that it may be Greek or Mesopotamia, but anyway. <laughs> I say Persia. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah. Like you say, everyone wants to find it. <laughs> Saffron's <laughs> good. That's all I know. It's, it's good. But now, uh, the Cuban, okay. Contemporary Cubans, they use this yellow food color in here. Yellow. This is what you find for the most part in the kitchens. Just mm -hmm. the normal everyday life. You want to put some color on the rice, you use this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called um, Bihol after the company. But this was the original company in Cuba. 1922 they were established. Um, anyway, I think they came They came to Miami. And uh, so Badia put out their own, and so that's fine. But what I like is what's really Cuban is the anato seed, which is the achiote seed, which is the Taino indigenous people of Cuba. This is what they colored their bodies with. And so I like this because it tastes better. You, you can make it the oil. You make the oil. See the color it has? It's so rich and beautiful, really. I just love it. I love the color. 
And so I like using it because it reminds me of the indigenous people of Cuba, and that's just one of their contributions. The barbecue is actually another one of them. They were the first to use the frame for barbecue, the Taino Indians of the Caribbean. So they have contributed quite a bit, and it's always nice to acknowledge uh, the contribution of all peoples, especially the first people. Okay, so the shrimp is in there. And now what happens, I guess, I will add the rice, okay, the rice, some salt, you know, I mean, I do measure at times, <laughs> but not right now. We'll see, you guys are going to have to taste this, so let's hope it's good. Is that spicy? The no. annatto? Annatto? Uh, you can smell it. You can smell it. No. No. Mm -hmm. You can smell it. Just wait. Once. Let me see. There's one thing. The beer. I have to put it in. Oh, that yeah. has to be. Here we yes, go. it has to be two cups of beer. Now, as you know, the alcohol will fizz out. And just whatever beer you have around the house. Usually, uh, <laughs> a light beer, not the dark beer, okay? Put that there. That's not quite at room temperature. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you you use it with the room temperature you just mentioned? Yes. So that there's a lot of dishes wow. in uh, Cuba that use beer in, in cooking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arroz con pollo, you know, beer is wow. popping. Wow. <laughs> yes, beer is oh, always good to have a beer. Happening. And it's good to have a beer with the meal as well, if you like beer. Mm -hmm. It's a nice thing to have, especially, you know, in a hot climate. And it depends what you like. The, some people like the wine. We cook with the wine, red yeah, wine. Yeah, yes, yes. Some people cook with, the, with wine. But these dishes, I say the beer. So, so instead of having water, yeah. right? Okay. Right. Instead of having one. Now we hope for the best, right? It looks pretty good. We could probably have a little bit more beer. <laughs> you never know, but it'll. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what's next? I think a little bit of coloring would be nice. So, what are you using for this coloring? The anato seed and oil. Oh, okay. Yeah, you make okay. it. It says how to do it right there on the back of the of the bottle. Mm -hmm. You just heat oil, and then you put the seed in there and let take it off the heat and let it, the oil become infused. Mm -hmm. And then when it's cold, you just pour it in a little bottle. Mm -hmm. Give it a little more color. We'll see what it looks like. Well, if we don't like the color, we can always just add more. It looks pretty good. Okay, so let me turn it up a bit and then cover it. Where's the cover? Okay, excuse me. Okay, so now it has to cook for a few minutes. <laughs> Actually, with you telling us about this table and what you have there. Okay, well, I, I brought, this is a little uh, Cuban corner that I uh, have here. Um, my husband, uh, when he went to Cuba separately from me, anyway, we, we bought some, some artwork. And so, uh, this piece, my mother bought in 1974, so it was 14 years into her exile, and she bought a painting of Cuba. This little piece right here. So I brought it from my parents' house and I keep it here. Mm. And the other pieces are more um, contemporary Cuba from the two trips that I took. Um, what I have here, which is kind of interesting, this is a steak pounder. If you're, you know, forget about meat tenderizer. This is what we eat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it weighs a lot. And it's just, you know, I don't use it in the kitchen, but it was at my parents' house, so I brought it here. It's a nice piece. Um, the sponges I'd like to show you. Yes, yes. These sponges, actually, my grandfather worked in the sponges in Cuba, in Batabano, and in Caibarín. He worked in the sponging industry. He was not a sponge diver, 
but he bought them and sold them. And um, I had his sister married a Greek man who had a big business, Luis Efakis, in, in Batabano, Cuba. Anyway, the sponges are part of my cultural heritage, and so I'm now selling these sponges. I got them from a sponge diver in Tarpon Springs, Tassel, my friend. And he's out diving right now. So I decided, well, you know, this would be a nice thing to to add to my heritage stuff. And these are for bathing, but um, they, they also have sponges. There are sponges that are coarser for cleaning. And uh, I'm be sure I'm going to be getting some of those. When he, he's fishing right now. He fishes in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the sponges are kind of fun. I love them. And uh, they're good to bathe with. What can I say? They're easy to take care of. You yeah. just, Nothing, man. You just wash, rinse. They're naturally antibacterial. They will never grow bacteria. And you know, they're just a nice cultural piece for me. The Greeks uh, dominated the sponge, the sponging industry, but the Bahamians, the Cubans, the Conks in Key West, and then in Tarpon Springs, the Greeks again. They, those are the big um, sponge uh, people in the Western Hemisphere. Now. I think off the course, the coast of North Africa, they were doing sponge diving way before. And anyway, I don't know the full history, but that's that's what I know. But anyway, they're fun. And so here's a book that I wrote. It's mm -hmm. called "We Carry Our Homes With Us." It's the story of our exile from Cuba and resettlement in Minnesota. And um, I think the strength of the book has to do with what happens to children. Uh, as they are faced with a larger culture mm -hmm. apart from the one that they were born with mm -hmm. and that their parents have. And so I think that that's one of the strengths of the book and for me it answered a lot of questions mm -hmm. as to what happened, now I know what happened. Because when I was a little girl, I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. You just feel that this is what's happening, this is how life is lived, and so oh, now we're living here, now we're living there. And so it did answer a lot of questions for me. You know, I tell you what, I've lived in St. Augustine since 05. And it was last year that I planted a Menorcan daddle pepper, a hot one and a sweet one. And I felt then that this was my home. Aww. That's how long it took just in this house. Mm -hmm. That's how long it took me. Now other people, might be faster, but that is the truth. And it was the battle pepper, it's out there. That's what wow. I took. Well, the book, it has a long genesis. In 08, I was in New York at a writer's conference, and I was trying to um, sell a novel. And I saw the Minnesota table over there, a little bunch of tables and different publishers all everywhere. And I, oh, Minnesota, you know, I said I was a little girl, I grew up there. I said, really? I said, yeah, you know, it's so great in Minnesota, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, well, would you like to um, write a book proposal for them? I said, what, are you an editor? She said, yeah. I said, oh, wow. And so it was because of, of her interest, Pamela McClanahan at the Minnesota Historical Society, um, that I saw there was an interest in, in that story. And uh, for me, it was an important story. But again, as a professional writer, the marketplace is important when you're trying to sell your work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can write a book about the sponges, mm -hmm. you know, and it needs a market. It needs a market. So that's what happened. So she asked me anyway, that was in 08, and then uh, the economic collapse came, mm -hmm. and then, anyway, it was a long time. And then it was in 2013, my friend Mark in Puerto Rico was dying, and I said, Mark, I'm going to revive that book proposal, and I'm going to um, dedicate it to you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I approached Pam again. And then this time, they, they went with it. They bought the book, and uh, then it went. And then this is a, I used to write commentary on Hispanic, like living, bicultural living in the United States. I used to be a columnist for Hispanic Link News Service in Washington, D.C. Hmm. 
anyway, the essays sometimes are funny, so mm -hmm. I said, well, they were already published. I said, I'll put them on the CD. So here they are. They're kind of fun. I still like them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if anyone else does, but I still do. And then the Cuban Rice Classics is my little cookbook. When I started um, doing the cooking demos in Tarpon Springs, it was my friend Tina who invited me initially. She needed a Latin American cook. And I said, okay, Tina, she knew I cooked. So anyway, I went down there. I really enjoyed it. And so I went down there several times and said, oh, you know, it'd be great to put some of these recipes together. And so that was a project that um, I worked on in 20, and I think it came out in 2013. Yeah. Anyway, they're classic dishes, and I think they're fairly easy, and uh, there's, there's some history in there, along with some family stuff. So. I don't know when I realized that. I just realized that my experience, in some ways, is like many others, is very common. However, as a writer, I, I didn't uh, spend a lot of time focusing on that experience early on, okay? Um, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, it wasn't until, I think, later that I said, okay, this is what I've got. This is what I need to speak up about. And it took me a long time. I'm a late bloomer for many reasons. Uh, one of them, I think, is because um, I came from a totalitarian regime where you're not really supposed to speak up about mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. So just keep your mouth shut and callate la boca, callate la boca, you know, no digas nada, that kind of thing, uh, whether you're just talking about a family matter or a larger political issue. And so I did not take on many of the subjects that are natural to me. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've avoided them. And it's only now in my later years that I am beginning to address some of those. Mm -hmm. Not all. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. not all. Some. I, I do agree a lot. I'm, I'm beginning now. But you see how old I am. That would take a long time to describe. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have many, I don't know that many Cubans here in North Florida, which is one of the reasons that I am taking on, well, I just got a grant from the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida to um, conduct some oral histories on Cubans who do live in North Florida and to talk to them about their assimilation rate because you know, if you move away, my theory is, and it's been documented by social scientists everywhere, you know, you move away from your main group and you're not getting the influx of the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not getting more people speaking Spanish, you're not, um, you're not getting more people reinforcing the cultural norms anymore. And so, I just, I'm interested in finding out where people are in that assimilation process. You know, because sometimes, you know, we don't have black beans and rice and roast pork for Christmas Eve. I mean, we just don't. I don't maybe feel like making that anymore, you know. So is that a sign of further assimilation for me? Mm -hmm. um, some people won't let go of, you know, a sweet potato pie for Thanksgiving. You know, it's just a matter of how willing mm -hmm. are people to drop a tradition you know, the turkey and the gravy and the mashed potatoes. If people don't have that for Thanksgiving, they might feel out of whack. Mm -hmm. But the first Thanksgiving, as we know, because we live in St. Augustine, was really garbanzos and chorizo and corn. I mean, that was really the first Thanksgiving. But anyway, there are all these traditions, and it's a matter of when do you want to drop that tradition? When is it time? Or when you just say, hey, you know what? I really don't care if I eat, you know, roast pork on Christmas mm -hmm. Eve. Mm -hmm. What? You know, I don't care. I'm going to have something else. So it's just that. But if you're in Miami, you're going to have that. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be on the table. Mm -hmm. In Minnesota, the reason they like this there were only 300 Cubans at the time that we lived there. Mm -hmm. 
And so it is a part of Minnesota history that happened, and who's going to write about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it was me. That's it. No one else took it on. Nobody else wanted to write about it. And then, as I, my father helped me quite a bit, by the way, um, with many of the, the stories. Mm -hmm. I told him one day, Dad, you know, if, if, and so Minnesota has its own interests because of documenting its own history, okay, that's one thing. Um, there are people, scholars, who study Cuban exile history and they may want it for their classes or for their, doc, you know, for their, what they teach and so on and so forth, okay. Historians, whatever, U.S. history, U.S. history, it is a part of U.S. history. However, I did, I remember telling my father, look, you know, Dad, if I don't write this down, it's going to be forgotten. Nobody's going to care. Nobody. It was as if it never happened. And that's how I live. And that's how many people live, okay? You live, you walk around with your history, and until someone asks you, and it doesn't have to be uh, that you're an immigrant or a refugee, anybody's history. What ha you know, what happened? Well, do you want to tell someone? Or do you want to keep it quiet and just go on? Mm -hmm. That's a choice, you know. And for me, it was important that I honor my parents in that way. That I take the time to do that, to document it. And so that I can speak about it in ways that may be beneficial to someone else. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whoever feels like reading it, mm -hmm. doesn't matter to me. I can help them. Maybe. Maybe we'll answer some questions. And going back to your table, uh, I see the basket there. Yeah. Is there another story of it? That's a hava. Hava. Hava? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you about it. That's from Cuba. And my cousins gave it to me mm -hmm. before I left. They said, well, what do you want as a gift? This is what you go and go find your vegetables every day, try to find your food. You go and you take a hava. This is what a hava is. So um, I put it there because it's culinary. It reminds me of Cuba. And uh, the hava was always something, you know, you always have to carry your things in something. Oh, this is a tostadera. I bought it. Anyway, have you ever the plantains? Have you ever yes. Yeah, so sometimes these are used to flatten them and then fry them a second time. Usually I use a paper bag, but it's um, something you can get in Miami. And, and then there's a friend brought from Cuba. She's, uh, she went and brought me that as a gift. That's amazing. That's one. Can you relate to any of it? Mm -hmm. Most of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's oh, the plantain. Oh, 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 well, <laughs> the, here's the plantain. You might see them, you know, at the store and wonder. This one's moving into uh, yellow, you know, and once it gets yellow with some brown spots, then you can boil this. It's actually very nice. And then it's in between the sweet and the starchy, so it has a nice texture. Um, when it gets really dark, almost brown, black, then you fry them a different, there are three ways to fry them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this, this one's kind of green, so I would probably cut it and then do, you know, do the flattening. Fry it once, take it out, flatten it, and fry it again higher. And then there's more like delicious, uh, they're like potatoes, they're starchy. But these have a very high fiber content, by the way. Mm -hmm. But this plantain is actually quite good. It has the same fiber content as oatmeal, which I would rather eat. I like oatmeal. Oh, but you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> want a plantain or some oatmeal? I think I'll eat it. You did mention before that you start also giving cooking classes uh, to some schools, oh, right? Yeah. So do you want to talk about that? Well, I just go whenever libraries or cultural centers. I taught a few classes at the Lighthouse. Um, I've taught at libraries. And if, you know, not, not too many places, but yeah, if I'm invited, I'll be happy to come and teach. At the Folk Festival, I was invited to um, a couple of times. The state, well, that's very nice. And the last time I was there, my sister joined me and we did Cuban coffee traditions, you know, to teach how to make Cuban mm. coffee. You know, there's, some people are really, you know, of course we're always into coffee, but you know, it's gotten more of a, um, 
different coffees have become more popular in the past 20 years. And so, you know, but how, how do you make Cuban coffee? How do you serve Cuban coffee properly? Mm -hmm. So it's not like people think, oh yeah, I want to make some Cuban coffee, and they have a cup this big and they break it all down. No, that's not the way it is. It's tiny. Is it just espresso? Yeah, but with oh. sugar. With sugar. sugar? With sugar. And then you make it a certain way, so there's like this foam on the top. Yeah. Is there a certain brand like Café Bustelo? Yeah, Café Bustelo. There's certain wow. some. Yeah. Food cooking is a natural way of sharing stories. Mm -hmm. How many times are you in the kitchen with someone, you're working in the kitchen with someone, and then you have a conversation mm -hmm. that's nice, that's real, that's quiet. It's nice. You learn a lot when you're in there cooking, if the person wants to talk to you, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you're working with family, especially my great aunt, she was the one who helped me, and I worked a little bit with her in the kitchen. When you're working with people who are in your family, that's a way for them to tell you something that they want you. So now, whenever I cook, I think of my great aunt, I think of my grandmother every time I make rice. Mm. Every time, and that's quite often. So it's a way to remember them, and uh, it's just a natural place to tell a story. If you've got somebody in there, yeah, I teach memoir writing uh, classes. Um, in whoever wants to hire me, I mean, libraries is usually it can anyway. I do that, and I teach the basics of of how to begin thinking about your memoir so you can overcome a lot of the obstacles that you may have to, to writing them. Um, I think that's the strength of the workshop and also some organic organizing methods. Mm -hmm. Because some people think, oh, I'm going to write my memoir. And oh, I'm not going to do that. It's going to take forever. I'm going to start from day one. Oh, no. You know, I was born here. Oh, no. No. That's too long. Everybody walking around with a book like this. No, no. The memoir, you focus on a triggering event. And then you tell that story. You don't have to write an autobiography. The, the Cubans doing the, uh, a different guacamole, too. It's a famous to in Cuba. Are you? A different guacamole? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have, actually they don't have that. You know, we have the avocado, mm -hmm. which, but we may, we use it a lot in uh, avocado and pineapple salads mm -hmm. with onion. Mm -hmm. And olive oil and, and lemon. Mm -hmm. And so it's Wow, yeah. what, do you, what do you call this dish? Just pineapple avocado salad with a little bit of onion. Mm -hmm. That's what's the different. Mm -hmm. You'll like that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Minnesota <coughs> has a long history of welcoming immigrants and refugees. A very long history. And so uh, they still do. They still do. Okay? So when we moved there in 1962, as I mentioned, we were very few, very few Cubans were there, but they have always been very welcoming mm -hmm. to immigrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. I have to say that about Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, the Twin Cities are known for their progressive, they have a very progressive society. Florida has its own problems. Every place has its problems. When we came, it was a segregated South. That's a problem. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. When I was a little girl, I didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. That's a problem when you go to school. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak English. And so it was difficult for me to make friends. Also, um, I look different than most of the Norwegians and Scandinavians and Germans and uh, Irish. So that was a not in my favor. It was isolating in many ways. But by third grade I did speak English and I have a good friend and we're still friends. And uh, she's my friend from my childhood friend from Minnesota. She says she lives in Miami. She loves it. So she's <laughs> she went down there. So, you know, it's good. 
But I, when you don't know the language, it's very, it's very isolating. Mm -hmm. Very isolating mm -hmm. and very difficult. And how did you overcome some of those differences that you faced? Sink or swim. Mm -hmm. We did not have bilingual education classes. We did not have special tutors. It was go and do it. And that's it. That's how we did it. No bilingual education? No. Uh, sing or swim? Yes. So you choose to swim? Well, you don't have a choice. Yeah. You don't have a choice. Because when you get home from school, there's no one there saying, oh, you're going to... No. It's you go study. You go learn. You go do. Period. There's no choice. That's fine. Excuse me. Yeah. There's no choice. And you wrote your book now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's... I know you guys can understand. Yes, definitely. Yes, that's fine. And you know what? It's okay. Because it works. Yes, it does. Okay, so let's go look at the dish. I'm excited to see <laughs> how it looks. It's and then we can throw this on top for a little more color. Hmm. And what else? We have some parsley. Hmm. Yeah, I'll just chop it up. And then we've got plates of it if you don't want to try it. You're welcome to try it with some crackers. I'm sorry, I didn't make a salad. I should have done that. But, you know, it's just, it's a colorful bit of a dish. Anyway, I think it's... Wow! Hey. It does look good and it smells good. So we have someone else testing the dish. <laughs> This program is brought to you by Islamic Relief USA, Welcoming Gainesville, Weave Tales, Reyes Legal PLLC, Engage, Florida Immigrant Coalition, We Are All America, Welcoming America, Museum of Science and History of Jacksonville, and the family of Andrea Myers and Matt McShett.